Well, good morning. This is Dr. Rungi. I had a horrible dream last night. I dreamt that like the whole class opened up the exegetical questions and read them and were like, oh no, this is horrible. And everyone dropped the class and it was canceled. It was horrible. But it made me realize uh, since it's been a couple of years since I've been in the classroom, that perhaps I was requiring too much synthesis of the readings too early before we had even met. And it might be worth making a video to explain some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about and like why I had you do some of those things that are in the questions. So I thought I would start with something, something simple. Like if someone was to ask me, what is an apple? You know, I can look at it and say, well, it's, it's a fruit. It has skin. Uh, describe an apple to me. Well, it's juicy. It's sweet. Uh, it has seeds in it. Um, but like it can be kind of hard when you're explaining something in a vacuum like that, right? Because I'm trying to come up with things. But... If someone were to say, Dr. Rungi, how would you compare, how does an apple differ from a potato? Then it's like, oh, well, yeah, like one grows in the ground and yeah, they both have skin, but like the other, I mean, I know there's technically lots of vitamins in here, but most of the time people throw it away where they don't peel an apple and like, you know, and one's a starch, you know, I could, or like, how does it differ from like a banana that really needs to be eaten? Uh, and again, let's like, it's, it's so much simpler when you have something because then you're just basically saying how it's not this other thing because you have something very specific in mind to think about. Now in linguistics, they'll talk about things called minimal pairs uh, where you're comparing like one thing against another that's, that's similar in a lot of respects, but it's different in some respects. Um, and in biblical studies, you don't do that that much. If anything, you'll try to find something else that's similar. So like, okay, here's Paul's use of this perfect verb, you know, this verb in a perfect form. And so I'm going to find some other place where he's used it and see how it's been translated or find some other similar thing. One of the things I'm asking you to do quite frequently in the exegetical questions is to basically say, how is an apple not a potato? Uh, so for instance, with relative pronouns, that's going to figure huge, huge, huge in chapter one, because we've got him at verse, uh, uh, verse seven. Let's see where else. Verse 11, verse 13, plus some other ones that are down in there that are that are smaller. And the difference, again, the, the potato versus the apple picture. Excuse me, I have hay fever. Um, um, apple and potato, right. Um, in main clauses, uh, the big question is, what's the big idea, right? I mean, that's like what preaching is it's what preaching is all about. I mean, next to alliteration and application, maybe it's like big ideas where it's at. So when you're going through and you're reading a passage and you have a series of coordinate clauses that are coordinated by kai, kai or de, um, they like at all, you know, kind of at face value, they're equally salient, equally important because they're all finite verbs, right? You're like, there's nothing to tell you that one is more important than the other. Now, some would say the verbal aspect plays a role, but we're not going to go there. Um, so you have like really nothing to go on, right? But if a writer uses dependency relationships like, uh, like, dependent clauses like relative pronouns, relative clauses that, that don't just have one relative clause, but they actually start a series of relative clauses. Like it's this, or not a series of relative clauses, but you have the first relative clause and then a series of coordinate clauses that start this unit. What you end up with, it's fascinating. You end up with like Paul doing this grammatical group hug 
to put all of these clauses together that could have been, could have been like co-equal coordinate ones in a giant grammatical group hug. And when you do a gra grammatical group hug like that, one of them has to be the main clause, right? Because like, that's what they're dependent on. Like, that's just kind of how it works, right? You get the other for free. And there is a striking correlation between the main clause and, wait for it, the big idea. Because all of the dependent forms, like, they're like, well, you know, talk about in the discourse grammar, which I'm sure you've totally read, totally mastered, and like, you already know all this, but just for the sake of like, over specification, participles, like you have circumstantial participles that precede that like you scene setting and set the state of affairs. And then the participle adverbial participles that follow a main verb, they elaborate in much the same way, dependent clauses that are either introduced by Hoti or Hina or Gar from a logical standpoint, uh, or relative pronouns. Those are, that's another strategy. All of these are ways, excuse me, of taking what this, uh, uh, what could have been a series of, of co-equal coordinate clauses, finite verbal clauses, and you promote one of them to big idea, that's your main clause, you anoint it uh, king or queen, and then all the rest of them are dependent and relate back to it in some way uh, that are fleshing it out or providing illustration or uh, an exposition of some kind or an application that just makes sermon prep so much easier because you know your big idea because it's the main clause. Uh, and, and then the other pieces are your sub points and we can figure out what their function is and what they're doing. And that way your preaching is a lot more in line with how Paul wrote the text, which to me just sounds really cool because then you're more in step with like authorial intent by paying attention to, uh, the grammatical decisions. Now, a lot of times, uh, just let you in on a little secret, Greek is not English. Like stuff that you can do in Greek just doesn't work in English. And so what you find is a lot of the major translations will take those relative clauses or take these dependent clauses and they'll make the main clauses and you, you lose the distinction. They actually make the potato for you. So it's kind of like doing you a favor. You can look at these translations who have, um, uh, they, they've like stepped away from Greek because again, Greek isn't English um, and translated these as though they're main clauses when in fact we know, because we can read the Greek, that there is a dependency relationship. And because of that dependency relationship, we know we have a grammatical group hug going on. So that's how you can also do the, do the comparison between the two. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, see if this worked. And then there's one other concept I want to talk about uh, after a bit about prepositions, but we'll come back to that in a separate video, I think.